Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker and you're watching Newswipe, a programme all about things that have been happening. Things like this. Islam will dominate the world, screams piece of paper held aloft behind small recently banned group in the snow. Woman watches in nodding amazement as televangelist performs Miracle of the Talking Anus while discussing cause of Haiti disaster. They got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you'll get us free from the French. True story. Fuck off! And eerie, uncomfortable scenes as Brown uses laptops in bid to lure young voters. Do you like computers now? Yeah. You, you find them quite, quite good. But we start as these things so often do in a small darkened room. We humans like to think we're more sophisticated than the rest of the animal kingdom just because we know how to operate a fan heater. But in truth, we're still primitive, easily spooked creatures that can't help pricking their ears up at the first hint of danger. Constantly being on the lookout for danger is a basic survival mechanism that served us jolly well throughout history. In fact, it's why we're all still here. Today, of course, we're not roaming the plains, listening out for lime noises and trying to avoid snakes. We're just flopping around at home, watching telly or reading the paper. But we're still alert to danger. It's just that the news has come to form part of our early warning system. The trouble is that while some things are authentically worrisome, the news has an inherent bias towards the worst case scenario in every single case. There's little middle register. Scientific projections, for instance, have a wide margin of error. If you're looking at some lurgy, the best case scenario could be that a mere 300 people could die. Or the worst outcome could be a body count of 300 million. News reports on the Lurgy will always focus on that scarier number because it's got more impact. It makes our primitive internal ears prick up. And this sometimes catches people unawares. For instance, recently the nation fought back tears of wet sympathy as Alistair Campbell recounted how shortly after helping to assemble a notoriously cautious and well-researched dossier, he looked on in powerless and surprised horror as the British press inexplicably focused on its scariest figures. Why? Even when the figures aren't in question, the way they're presented ramps up the fear. The swine flu sweeping around the globe is now in Britain. The news has long served as a kind of endless conveyor belt, delivering one concern after another directly into your living room. And just like haircuts or shoes, different scares go in and out of fashion. The terrifying spectre of all-out nuclear war was one of the coolest news stories for years, although looking back at coverage from the 80s, what's notable is how emotionless and businesslike it seems considering the stakes. Britain's doctors say 33 million people in this country may be killed and injured in a nuclear war. Well, you've got to admire his inner steel. If I had to deliver news like that to the nation, I'd read it off the autocue through a haze of tears while tying a noose under the desk. The 80s were terrifying all round. When we weren't stocking our nuclear bunkers with bin bags, we rang our mitts over problems such as AIDS, football hooligans, and most sinister of all, eggs. The One O'Clock News from the BBC with Philip Hayton. Good afternoon. The government is introducing new measures to combat salmonella in eggs. Scrambled eggs, fried eggs, poached eggs, I don't really believe any cooking can render those safe that doesn't destroy the flavour. So you're telling people to stop eating eggs, really? That's right. But fuck eggs and check out this immense threat to civilization. Yes, any youth phenomenon almost automatically becomes a moral panic. And the late 80s provided an absolute humdinger in the form of Acid House, which worried many with its lurid dancing and pill-chugging culture. World in Action considered it such a menace, they devoted an entire straight-faced episode to uncovering the truth behind this sinister scene, which, as it helpfully pointed out, was receiving measured, cool-headed coverage at the hands of Fleet Street. Some newspapers have called Acid House music a sinister and evil cult which lures young people into drug-taking. The message is certainly getting across. What do you know about acid house music? There's, there's meant to be a drugs related craze. Uh, it seems to be the most worrying thing. And where did you find that out? That was in the paper. Do you think there's anything it, to do it, with a certain religion, do you think? No, is there anything it's like it? that? No, no, it's more to do no. with a kind of a drug, isn't it? It's a drug. Yeah, well, those that take it want to be, ought to be ashamed well. of themselves. While the public and the media worried about the effects of ecstasy, the users themselves seem curiously upbeat about the whole thing. Let's hear from a sweaty man and a wookie. I don't think doing an E every couple of weeks is going to be any worse for me than smoking or drinking. Really? 
The 90s veered from drugs to bugs as the tabloids seized on a random cluster of cases of necrotizing fasciitis, which had been around since the 1800s, and sexually rechristened it the flesh-eating bug, thereby helpfully scaring the shit out of millions. Even people who'd already had it got retrospectively concerned. They told me I was a lucky boy in the hospital, but it doesn't really hit home then. Now, reading all this stuff in the newspaper, now it's hit home now, yeah. The furore was so large, it even made headlines in funny foreign countries. The mysterious flesh-eating bacteria. Fears of a flesh-putrefying epidemic quickly died away, to be replaced by concern about an epidemic of anger reportedly sweeping Britain's highways. An epidemic known as road rage. Road rage is that point when a motorist loses control of his or her, her behaviour, when they actually do go, for a short time, completely mad. Come on, look forward a bit. I was supposed to look at this wanker. Are you going to let me out or what? Fuck you, Lil. Just a few days ago in Newcastle, another driver had his nose bitten off. Incredibly, mankind somehow managed to survive road rage and made it all the way through the 90s, only to find itself plunged headlong into a war with the machines on the eve of the millennium. The fear is that the computer systems that support our lives are far more vulnerable than we ever could have imagined. The millennium bug was definitely going to kill everyone. Apocalyptic predictions were trumpeted for months. Fear-mongering coverage repeatedly warned us to be on the lookout for plummeting planes and malfunctioning ATMs. Hospitals would explode. Cars would inexplicably transform themselves into grapefruit. Robots would wave their arms around screaming, does not compute for a while and then rise up and kill. <laughs> And if that wasn't bad enough, it was a nightmare for corned beef fans. Marks and Spencer almost destroyed a consignment of corned beef when their computer system mistakenly told them that the tins were decades old. Come Millennium Eve itself, the BBC nervously wheeled out its big guns to stand in front of a giant rotating globe and see the world get destroyed. But the only thing that really seemed to be affected was Peter Snow's auto cue. So far, it's cost us about £250 billion to take on the bug. And that's the way it's been. <clears throat> 250 billion pounds has cost us. Shortly after the millennium, something genuinely bloody terrifying did happen, making terrorism the most sensational number one fear in the shit yourself parade for years. Terrorism, of course, is a story which has received the kind of calm, measured coverage we've come to expect, rivaled only by the rise of the paedophiles. A series of hard-hitting Sky News reports reveals how these characteristically haunted-looking gentlemen have infiltrated virtually every aspect of society. They can be found lurking in schools or hiding under towels in the backs of Australian cars. He's chased by photographers, chased out of Australia and back to Britain. They run sophisticated advertising campaigns on trains. Scrawled on a toilet door was an advert asking for young girls for sex. They even commit foul made-up crimes in lurid made-up worlds on the internet. We've uncovered paedophiles acting out sexual encounters with virtual children in the internet world of Second Life. And when children aren't being endangered by sex beast monster scumbags, they're at threat from virtually everything else. Mobile phone bullying, obesity, knife crime. They're not afraid to show them to camera and they're not afraid to use them. What's he going to do with that? Slice up a Hawaiian?